Hi, everyone. Welcome again to the Borderline Personality Disorder Family and Consumer Education Webinar Series. My name is Chris Palmer. I'm a psychiatrist here at McLean Hospital and Harvard Medical School. It's my pleasure to welcome all of you to the webinar. Today we're joined by Dr. Lois Choi Kane. Dr. Choi Kane has given a couple of webinars before, so you might recognize her from previous webinars if you've watched them. Dr. Choi Kane is an assistant professor of psychiatry at Harvard Medical School. She is also the program director of the Gunderson Residence, which is a residential treatment program for people suffering from personality disorders and um, often borderline personality disorder. And she's also the director of the McLean Hospital Borderline um, Personality Disorder Training Institute, which is focused on educating professionals about borderline personality disorders and empirically proven um, treatment for borderline personality disorder. Um, before we get started, a few logistical announcements. All of your identities have been concealed from other participants, so no one can see your email address or your phone number. But we do want this to be interactive, as interactive as possible. So in the lower right-hand corner of your screen, you'll see a Q&A box. And if you have questions during the webinar, or if you've come to this webinar with specific questions or uh, a case that you would like input on, uh, feel free to type those in. And if you've come to the webinar with one, you can even type it in now, and we'll put it in queue and get through as many of them as we can. In the lower left-hand corner of your screen, you'll see uh, links to several websites. The first one is uh, our initiative website. So you'll see all of the archived webinars, and you can sign up for upcoming webinars there. Um, that next link is for our May 24th webinar. And then the following three links are two nationally recognized resources on the topic of borderline personality disorder. You can even get referral information for treaters near you from some of those sources. And then finally, I want to recognize that this entire webinar series has been made possible through a philanthropic gift by a family affected by borderline personality disorder. <clears throat> and we would love to be able to continue these. If you're in a position to be able to help support these, you can click on that last link and give a gift, large or small, that will help us um, continue this webinar series. And with that, I'm going to turn the webinar over to Dr. Choi King. Hi, everyone. It's good to be back. And I just want to start by saying that I really appreciate um, this forum. I did the first webinar, actually, and I did one on compassion fatigue. And it's always a good opportunity for me to learn about a topic that is of interest to the field and of interest to patients and their families. So thank you, um, Chris and Dawn, for this opportunity. And thank you for the um, people who made this program possible. I think for us to be able to reach a lot of people all over the world is really important so that all of us can learn how to better support people who have both borderline personality disorder and complex PTSD. Um, to start with, I think that even in my own short career, I've seen a lot of changes in the field regarding attitudes towards borderline personality disorder versus PTSD. From the beginning of my career, there are these raging divides. Is it BPD or PTSD? And I think we've come to a reconciliation that actually a lot of people with BPD have PTSD and a lot of people with PTSD have BPD. And there is something that is not captured in the DSM diagnostic system that has to do with people who have suffered ongoing childhood abuse to develop something that is known as complex PTSD in the international classification system. So I'm going to do my best to update you on what we know so far, the progress in the field on understanding the similarities the differences and the treatment approaches to these three diagnostic entities. Okay. 
So we're going to start with the DSM. And the interesting thing about this is that it took preparing this lecture, which I did for a conference that Chris asked me to be a part of, where um, I had to look at this, revisit this question. What are the differences and similarities between complex PTSD and BPD? And I had a co-presenter on my um, schedule with me. It was an honor to present with Jim Chu, who is a expert on the topic of complex PTSD. Now, he and John Gunderson wrote a paper in 1993, I think it was. I, I refrained from saying, this was like when I was in college. <laughs> but they had written a paper together on this topic. And there were some real agreements they had about it back then, and there were some real disagreements. When I revisited this literature, I realized that actually complex PTSD never made it to the DSM, which I kind of didn't realize until I had to give this talk. Because we all, as clinicians, know it as an entity, and people talk about it all the time. But there's something very important related to this, is that there's still work to be done on clarifying the validity of the diagnosis. Now, that being said, I'm not saying that people don't have complex PTSD. But there is a scientific process through which different disorders go to kind of establish a validity as a concept, OK? But to get to a less academic side of this, what I tried to do with my um, a research assistant, Ellen Finch, who's helped me with these slides and this research, um, is really kind of clearly def differentiate the symptoms that exist in the DSM about these two disorders. So you see on the left, PTSD is in the maroon, OK? There are distinct symptoms that have to do with PTSD. And there is a distinct experience, having a sort of trauma that is experienced as very life-threatening or witnessing something that's life-threatening, that um, around which the memories um, you have problems of re-experiencing, that is flashbacks or nightmares. You have problems of trying to avoid either memories or triggers of memories. Numbing and dissociation are some of those kind of processes. And there's also this, these symptoms related to a sense of threat, that is hypervigilance and a sense of uh, kind of vulnerability to startle, that there, there seems to be this sense that there's danger everywhere. And people who suffer from PTSD may maintain this kind of hyper-vigilant, hyper-aroused state. So we know that there are these major domains of PTSD. And on the other hand, there are quite different symptoms associated with BPD, which we see in the green. So the symptoms that BPD is most known for, the reasons that most people come to treatment in acute settings like the emergency room, the hospital, um, intensive levels of care, includes suicidal behaviors, gestures, or threats, and deliberate self-harm. These are things that happen for people who have BPD as a response to feeling emotional dysregulation feeling out of control, and having um, either life stressors or um, interpersonal stressors. Often those life stressors are interpersonal in nature. Related to the fact that borderline personality disorder is a personality disorder, we know that there are two main areas of disturbance in personality disorder. That is in relationship functioning and in sense of self. So true to that, people with borderline personality disorder have these problems in relationships where they become very unstable in the sense they oscillate between thinking of people as all good or all bad, idealizing or devaluing them, and also at the same time having a frantic kind of sense of needing to avoid abandonment. John Gunderson once called this intolerance of aloneness. Now, um, in addition to that, there is this problem with a sense of self. If you think of personality as an envelope, people who feel out of control all the time, vacillate in their relationships, are con get confused 
about themselves, who they are, what they want, what they're doing, and have a lot of problems of identity. Okay? So the envelope of, per, of personality contains all this. But for people who are borderline personality disorder, they don't have a stable sense of that envelope, stable sense of personality or identity. So it's quite hard for people with borderline personality disorder to navigate the world reliably and in a way that they can predict um, in terms of what can happen to them. All right? So there's a great degree of mistrust of themselves and of the world. Now, overlapping closer to PTSD are a lot of symptoms that um, have to do with emotional regulation problems and just a sense of badness, okay? So these are personality disorder symptoms as well, that most people who have personality disorders have some problem of emotional um, imbalance or dysregulation and um, also feeling quite badly about oneself and sometimes others in the process. So that's the DSM. Now, if you shift to more clinical features, this is probably hard for you to read, but this is a diagram that was um, printed in an overview paper by Patricia Rezik, who is a expert in port um, complex PTSD, PTSD, treatments for PTSD, and she did this very good overview of the overlaps and differences between complex PTSD, PTSD, and BPD. So as you can tell, this slide is very busy because there are a lot of different features that belong in some categories but not others, and some really overlap. And as you see, complex PTSD is that dotted line circle. It encompasses some, something about all of these disorders. It encompasses some of the core symptoms of PTSD, some of BPD, some of MDD, and some of what's called um, dissociative, um, these dissociative episodes and dissociative problems, okay? Um, it's called disorders of extreme distress not otherwise specified. All right. Now this is my version, and this is just my clinical opinion. This is not based on a study or fact, but I think there are certain symptoms that are related to PTSD. Again, I agree with the DSM for the most part, that there are these symptoms that are um, intrusive thoughts about the trauma, avoidance of trauma-related cues, heightened startle, hypervigilance, and then there's something that verges into negative thinking that's related to being depressed. People get depressed who are in this state. Oftentimes, PTSD may increase vulnerability to developing depression as well. And then on the BPD side, you see the, either the identity or the interpersonal problems or the self-destructive problems. But in the overlap between these three disorders, which are oftentimes running together, are just, I think, signs of stress, irritability, aggression, risky or destructive behaviors. We all do that <laughs> under stress to some degree, maybe not as severe as would meet criteria for these disorders. And also under stress, we experience things like fatigue, sleep disturbances, affective instability, depressed mood. And, you know, actually I was just at a dissertation defense, and all of us to some degree develop some suicidal ideation, actually. Some people will think, I have this test tomorrow, I'm not ready for it, or maybe I should just die. That's a kind of suicidal thought, but it's not necessarily being suicidal. We all develop things like that under stress. And there's also negative thoughts about the self and the world, feeling isolated, feeling hopeless, difficulty concentrating, guilt and shame. These are reactions to severe stress, okay? So they're not in one domain over the other. They're shared. Now, where I think complex PTSD comes in is all over most of this, okay? So what I would argue is not to undermine the fact that people really suffer from this, but they're suffering from a cluster of different outcomes that are related to being traumatized chronically and how much that interferes 
with both your personality development and your capacity to endure life stress, which leads to a vulnerability for developing major depression, okay? So one of the questions I really have for the field, I can't possibly answer it now, is whether or not it's more useful to diagnose complex PTSD or it's more useful to diagnose these three disorders that coexist, okay? Now, I'm going to have to present some more facts that might help you kind of um, decide whether you're in one direction of wanting to treat it as complex PTSD or the other as treating it as multiple problems that are outgrowth of the same situation. Now, I borrowed this slide from um, my colleague, Martin Bohus, who I'm working with as a visiting professor at McLean Hospital, who's trying to bring a treatment that he's tested for complex PTSD called DBT-PTSD here to the state, to McLean to start. And what he says, which I've heard many times before, but this diagram nicely illustrates the statistics of it, is that childhood sexual abuse is a risk factor for multiple psychiatric problems. It's damaging to people's psyche to have childhood sexual abuse, okay? So this is something that increases risk for a number of disorders, whether they're anxiety problems, depression, eating disorders, substance abuse, PTSD, sleep disorders, suicide attempts, or BPD. So people are at risk for all these things, including dissociative features, which is not necessarily related to disorder, low self-esteem, or somatic disorders, okay? So as a clinician, you may see all these things in people who have childhood sexual abuse. As a patient, you may suffer from all these things if you have suffered childhood sexual abuse. And it's also important to acknowledge that there are people who suffer childhood sexual abuse that develop none of these psychiatric problems. They do exist. Now, childhood abuse in general is something, um, childhood abuse and neglect increases the risk um, by four times for personality disorders in early adulthood. This is something that we have found from prospective studies, meaning that when, you, when this one researcher, Johnson, and his colleagues took a sample of people in a part of New York and followed them for many years, looking at the relationship between documented abuse and psychiatric illness, they found that those who had documented childhood abuse and neglect had four times greater likelihood of having a personality disorder, okay? The risk is highest for cluster B disorders, which include histrionic, narcissistic, borderline, and antisocial. So when the other personality disorder symptoms are accounted for, sexual abuse is associated with increased BPD symptoms. And this may kind of be hard to understand. And it does not increase risk more for BPD than other cluster B disorders. So it's true there's an association between childhood abuse and neglect and BPD, but I think there's an argument here that childhood abuse and neglect interferes with personality development and increases risk for personality problems in general. BPD being a more kind of um, general severe personality problem that are, is related to a lot of psychiatric illness. And it's important to remember that while I completely acknowledge that childhood abuse and neglect is pathogenic in many cases, it causes psychiatric problems in many cases, it's also important to acknowledge that trauma is neither necessary nor sufficient as an explanation for why people develop BPD. One of the m major findings that I think must be underlined is not everyone with BPD has experienced childhood trauma. And the reason that this is really important to acknowledge is that many families have done the best they can. And of course, parents all make mistakes. And it doesn't mean that they haven't done their best to help their child to grow up in a healthy way. 
and the BPD may be an outgrowth of many things um, aside from parenting, and it may include parenting. So this is very important for clinicians to understand so that you can work with parents rather than see them as the problem in all cases. Doesn't mean that in some cases um, it is better not to include parents. It's a real clinical question to be considered. Now, neglect actually represents a more serious risk, and we know that this is a part of the equation of why people encounter abuse outside the home. And um, it's also important to know that heritability matters, too, that there is some genetic contribution and some environmental contribution, including trauma, that um, contributes to the risk for developing BPD. Now, what are the numbers to this? Exactly how many people with PTSD have BPD and how many people with BPD have PTSD? I consider this an incredibly important question because a lot of times people think they're synonymous. I can't tell you how many conferences I've either run or spoken at where people ask me, isn't BPD just PTSD or some form of PTSD? And I can say with confidence, no, from this data. So we know that BPD, of people in the community, not just people in hospitals, only a third of people with BPD have PTSD, okay, in studies, very good studies. And in PTSD samples in the community, only a quarter of those people have BPD. So the majority of people with BPD don't have PTSD, and a majority of people who have PTSD don't have BPD in the community. This is a more variable population, and this is not the treatment-seeking population. Now, this does change in clinical samples, which is what contributes to the misunderstanding that BPD equals PTSD. So when you go to hospitals or settings where there are patients, what we see is actually most of the patients with BPD have PTSD, but of the patients who have PTSD, only a third of them have BPD, a little over a third, okay? So keep that in mind, that a lot of people with BPD actually are prone to have adult trauma, and they may have PTSD related to that. Some of them have childhood trauma, and I'll get into that in the next slide. And of people with PTSD, some people come with a pre-existing risk factor of also having BPD. That may make them more likely to develop PTSD because people with BPD don't have good coping strategies and they don't have adequate support systems to face trauma and not have a psychiatric problem from that. Now, moving to complex PTSD, there are not as many studies of this, so this is based on limited studies, but what the literature tells us is of the people who have BPD, less than half of them have complex PTSD. I know this graph is a little bit misleading because the PTSD is on the wrong side of it, but basically it's, it's only half and actually less than that. So, of the people who have complex PTSD, though, even fewer of those people have BPD, less than 10%. That's pretty remarkable. So just because people have complex PTSD, that does not mean they have BPD, okay? And only one in two of those who have BPD have complex PTSD, okay? And this is still with limited, limited studies, so that might be a lot less in some other samples, okay? We have to learn more about this, that. Now, I have a thought about this, and I'm going to build my argument based on some research. Our colleague, Carla Sharp, and her collaborators did a study at the Menninger program of over 1,000 outpatients, and it's a very clinically important study. They did a set of statistical analyses. I won't get into the academic details, but what they found was that when you take the different symptoms of personality disorders, like borderline, narcissistic, antisocial, avoidant, obsessive compulsive, and so on, and you try to do some analysis of whether or not those symptoms really belong to the 
set disorder, like avoidance symptoms belong to avoidance disorder, or whether or not they belong to some more general factor. What Sharp found was that borderline symptoms loaded onto a general factor of personality um, disorder, while most of the other symptoms for the other disorders loaded some onto the discrete disorder and some onto this general factor. Now, what this says is that BPD may be the prototype of personality disorder, that people who have these symptoms are likely to have more severe problems they're likely to be more prone to other, what we call access one disorders, like mood disorders, anxiety disorders, substance use disorders, behavioral disorders. And those who have other disorders may have a more focused set of problems. That's my take on that. And there's, um, this is a kind of busy um, diagram that you might not be able to read well on your slide, but you can see how the different symptoms in the middle map onto the different diagnoses. And you see this, that the red symptoms at the very top all load onto the general factor, except for just a couple of them. Now, actually, there was another researcher, very well-known, very accomplished, respected researcher named Caspi, who did this kind of study outside of the field of personality disorders. He did a really incredible study of a bunch of people in a community in New Zealand, and it was called the Dunedin Study. And what they did was they followed people from birth to the age of 33. So they followed them meticulously and carefully in their childhood, studied lots of factors within their development, and then they studied their psychiatric problems at the end, throughout the adulthood. So they got to see what factors were associated with the development of different disorders over their childhood and adolescence into adulthood. And what they found was in the statistical analysis that there's a more global factor called the P factor, which when this is high in people, their likelihood of developing disorders early and over time developing more complex disorder and more recurrent or more persistent disorder was higher. These people had more troubled developmental histories. They showed sign of signs of compromised early brain function. And they showed general life impairment. So there is something generally that makes people at risk for a number of different psychiatric problems. We haven't identified what that thing is. Nobody knows what it is. Peter Fonagy jokes that everyone's lining up trying to write their grants to figure it out, so we may figure it out eventually. But what we do know is it's not just that one disorder has different risk factors than another disorder, that there may be general factors that make people psychiatrically ill, put people at risk. Now, this brings us to the question of specifically complex PTSD and BPD. Some people have asked the question, is complex PTSD an amalgam of BPD and PTSD, meaning just a mixture of the two? In the beginning of this lecture, I talked to you about how they have these disorders, PTSD and BPD, have quite different DSM symptoms, okay? But, you know, that's just a clinical, you know, overview analysis of it, and I gave you my own clinical experience analysis of it, but there is one paper that I think is quite good. So this researcher, Cloitra, if I pronounced it correctly, has done some really good research that is the foundation for our empirical literature on what we know about this topic. So she took people who were in some treatment trials and um, found 280 women who had histories of childhood abuse enrolled in these treatment outcome trials, okay? And then she looked at their symptom profile using a variety of measures that are valid in scientific study. We all think they're good measures. And then she did the statistical analysis. And what she found was that there are, there is evidence that there are three distinct kind of um, symptom profiles that would fit complex PTSD, BPD, and PTSD. So there's some sort of 
data that supports the notion that these are three different ent entities that overlap to some degree or may be coexisting in some patients. Now, the four types are listed here. There was a low symptom type, people who had childhood abuse, but was, were low on all symptoms. That just goes to show that people have sometimes some factors in their life situation and their biological endowment that helps them not to develop many symptoms, even though they've had childhood abuse. Then there's a PTSD type, where they mostly have PTSD symptoms and not the complex PTSD or BPD symptoms. There's also a complex PTSD type that does have both PTSD and complex PTSD symptoms, but low BPD symptoms. And lastly, there's a BPD type that has mostly BPD symptoms. So this is really important research that confirms we're all right. They're all kind of clinically valid entities to some degree. This is just early support of this. And you know, the important thing that I, will, I think is really important is that there are four symptoms for clinicians out there that make it more likely that you're of the BPD type over the complex PTSD type. And they are frantic efforts to avoid abandonment, unstable sense of self, unstable and intense of interpersonal relationships, and impulsiveness. And so what I have to say about this is that in, in our world at the Gunderson program, led by our figurehead John Gunderson, we really believe that the interpersonal realm of functioning is the differentiating um, set of symptoms of BPD. A lot of disorders have emotional dysregulation, and definitely BPD is characterized by emotional dysregulation. But the interpersonal symptoms is what we believe differentiates it from others. Now, just for those of you who are more visual, this is a graphic of Poitras' findings. And this is a very busy slide. But what you see from this is that there are the three types. On the left, if you can see this in the blue, are the PTSD symptoms. In the middle, in the green, are the what is approximated as complex PTSD symptoms. And on the right are BPD symptoms. And the red line is BPD. So people with BPD have lots of symptoms. So the 50% line is in the blue. People who have this um, BPD profile have high ratings of lots of symptoms. They're just vulnerable. They have lots of problems broadly in many areas of personality functioning and the functioning of the mind, the functioning of emotion. People who have complex PTSD rate highly, like Cloitra said, in the PTSD and complex PTSD realm, but not really in the BPD realm. And what you see here is where they rate highly is the emptiness criteria. And I think that's related to a tendency to kind of um, dissociate, evacuate in the face of very painful, traumatic experiences. So the important part is treatment. I think that diagnosis is important so far as it guides treatment. We don't diagnose people to malign them or devalue them or criticize them. We, de we diagnose them to understand what goes on for them and build an um, effective and reliable pathway to helping them get better. So this is where treatment may inform how we diagnose people based on what we can do for them. So this is a chart that um, Ellen Finch, my right-hand woman, made about the number of randomized controlled trials for the treatment of BPD in the red, complex PTSD in the green, and both BPD and PTSD in the orange. Okay. So the takeaway point here is that now we have a lot of randomized controlled trials that show many, many treatments work for borderline personality disorder. Now, complex PTSD has suffered the fact that it was not a DSM um, diagnosis. So in order to get research funding for treatment, there has to be a DSM diagnosis. So that's really hampered a lot of research. So there are some trials that I'll talk about, and there are some treatments, but none of them are standalone treatments. Now, there is early research that's showing that there is an approach 
that's based on dialectical behavioral therapy for BPD and PTSD that works. And I'll go over that as well. So many of you who are avid followers of this webinar series know that there are these four types of treatments for borderline personality disorder. And this I see as good news. Lots of different ways of um, cutting the pie work for BPD. This is a huge sea change from when, even when I started my residency training, where a lot of people, and maybe still this is the way in some areas, a lot of people believe that people with BPD were not treatable. And they were wrong. Because it's just the treatments we've used for other things didn't work for these patients who had these particular problems that we didn't diagnose and we didn't therefore target. So now we know that these treatments really work for these patients, that oftentimes clinicians find either behaviorally or interpersonally challenging because of their symptoms. So the good news is a lot of things work. The bad news is that these treatments are very time consuming and sophisticated. So what you see here is that DBT involves one weekly individual, two hour group of skills training, and paging your therapist to help you change your behavior 24 hours a day, seven days a week. And then the therapist has to go to consultation team to help them be effective. This is the ideal. I think this is a very effective treatment. It's revolutionized the world of treatments for BPD and psychotherapy. So I have a lot of respect for this, but the problem with this is this is very hard to implement in most treatment settings. I know psychiatrists who work in areas that they're the psychiatrist for 30,000 people. They couldn't possibly do this for people where there's no psychologist or it's hard to find one. And let's face it, in America where there is a kind of capitalist economy, what governs this unfortunately is economics. Supply and demand. Low supply, high demand equals high cost. And that may be true of all these treatments. MBT was developed in the National Health Service in the UK, and therefore it was developed and tested in a, a public health environment. It has less time involved with once weekly individual therapy and once weekly group with a team meeting. And it's more kind of simplistic in its approach, even though it's elegant in its theory. TSP was born out of psychodynamic outpatient practice. So this is practiced on a twice weekly individual therapy basis. And it uses psychodynamic ideas to help people integrate the black and white thinking and the vacillations in how they think about their relationships. Okay? And GPM, lastly, which is the co last contribution of John Gunderson as he kind of um, culminated his career, is to develop a generalist model that involves um, using all the state of the art knowledge we know about BPD to guide good clinical management of patients using at most once weekly uh, meetings. Now, if we shift over to complex PTSD, PTSD treatments work a little bit differently. I think the pro of PTSD treatments are they, they're very practical. They tend to be short and focused. Now, in um, a lot of committees where they're trying to develop these treatments for complex PTSD, they came up with this really um, very straightforward, very relatable framework that there's three phases Phase one is stabilization. Phase two involves the processing of traumatic memories, sometimes through exposure therapy, sometimes through cognitive processing, sometimes through um, narrative therapy. And phase three involves reintegration, trying to build a life, trying to um, kind of make meaning of one's total life, not including the trauma, not just the trauma, or not just life without trauma. Now, the first um, empirically tested treatment for complex PTSD is an approach called STAIR, the Skills Training in Affect and Interpersonal Regulation Treatment that was developed by uh, Cloitra and Colley. 
And what this treatment is, it's very practical because it's like a short pretreatment for treatments we know work for just PTSD, like exposure therapies, not narrative therapies. And um, Kalutra calls these um, skills DBT-like skills. They compress what takes a year in DBT into um, like tw age 12 sessions, and there's um, skills training to help the person with interpersonal regulation, and then that primes them to be ready for the prolonged exposure. Because they're going to need skills to manage themselves and manage the relationships that support them through this very difficult process. Now, the problem is the research on this is limited. It needs more investigation. So like I said, this, um, the skills training is, you know, as designed, eight sessions. And um, then it's combined with something else. It's not standalone treatment. And what it involves, I think that's really interesting, is that it involves some DBT skills in multiple areas. But in the interpersonal realm, it pays attention to um, interpersonal relationships that have power dynamics because these are quite charged for people who have been abused. Um, and this is something that this treatment really um, smartly provides patients with skills over so that they can do better and not be in the same trap of feeling controlled and victimized over and over again in every relationship that they are in that's a close relationship where they feel vulnerable. So in this um, treatment where they combine this with exposure therapy, which is a um, kind of central model of treatment that works for PTSD, just straight PTSD, they found that there was greater sustained full um, and full PTSD remission, more emotion regulation skills than just for those who get exposure. There's decreased interpersonal problems um, and decreased dropout. These are really major important findings. And this is a graphic of some of their findings um, from the American Journal in 2010. For those of you who don't know, American Journal is kind of a flagship jur journal of American psychiatry. And um, this just goes to show the kind of um, quality of this research. And as you can see here, the stare is in the red line. And you see that the PTSD symptoms go down um, pretty kind of um, consistently, that the interpersonal problems decrease in the red in the upper right, and the negative mood uh, regulation scale, meaning regulation of negative mood, increases in that red line. You see that kind of differentiation. So we know, looking at this, if you look at BPD treatments, there's lots of them. And they're moving steadily towards being simpler being more implementable, having more diversity, so different clinicians can use different approaches that are comfortable to them, that appeal to them, that they feel genuine with. In complex PTSD, there's only that red treatment. And for the combined comorbidity of BPD and PTSD, there's DBT PTSD, which I'll talk about. Now, there are limitations when there are comorbidities that BPD treatments for complex PTSD might not always be optimal, but may be the only thing you have. But the reason they're not optimal is that there's lower BPD recovery rates and treatment responses for those with co-occurring PTSD. It's just that some co-occurring disorders make it harder to treat the disorder you're trying to treat. When there's major depression, it's harder to treat that if there's BPD. When there's PTSD, it's um, harder to treat BPD. Okay? It doesn't mean you shouldn't treat it. But among um, patients with BPD who don't achieve remission, 71% have co-occurring PTSD. So we think this is something that's a stopping block for recovery for people with BPD. And BPD treatments really focus on the here and now. Build a life from here. Try to um, repair those things that aren't working and getting in the way of your building a satisfying life now, okay? But PTSD treatments sometimes have to involve some exposure or processing of traumatic memories. So there's that kind of tension there. 
And oftentimes what we find as a challenge in any therapeutic approach is people who have complex PTSD, who have been chronically uh, abused or chronically hurt by people they trusted, it's hard for them to trust anyone in therapy. So, you know, I really have a lot of compassion for people who are in um, a position of being in this group of patients. Complex PTSD is very hard to live with and very hard to connect with as a clinician. Now, there are also um, the limitations of PTSD treatments for BPD because PTSD um, tr treatments are based on evidence as well. There's lots of evidence-based treatments for PTSD, but those studies routinely exclude people with BPD because if you have suicidality or self-harm, you're not allowed to be in that treatment trial. So how well these treatments work for people with BPD is kind of unknown. And the reason they're excluded is maybe there's an idea that doing this with people who have a fragile skill set for coping is not always what's in their best interest without some attention to building skills. So, um, you know, the, we also know through the literature that common BT, BPD characteristics like suicide attempts um, and childhood trauma predict worse responses to PTSD. And the truth is, while we have all this great science about this, in the real world, the availability of these treatments is completely inadequate for those who need them. Um, I was re when I was at this PTSD conference, there was a lot of great um, science, and the, and the talks were just so enlightening and optimistic about how many psychotherapeutic approaches work for PTSD. And then when I asked the audience how many of those people, those clinicians, out of this large group of almost 500 people, were trained in evidence-based treatments for PTSD, it was not a lot of them. It was less than 20%. So even though we in the field all know these evidence-based treatments work, very few people practice these evidence-based treatments because of the demand of both the training and the treatment themselves. We need to work on that. So lastly, talking about the current treatment. So I want to talk to you about DBT PTSD because it is the future, I think, and a huge step forward that gives us hope for trying to mend the divide between those of us who study BPD and treat it and those of us who study PTSD and treat it. Because most of the clinical population of those who have BPD also have PTSD. That's why we, in our side of the camp, care about this. And we need to do better. And we need to let the kind of old fights die down so that we can treat patients more effectively. So a forerunner of this work is Martin Bohus, whose work I really admire. He did a recent webinar on this, so you can look for it in the library. But he started with a safety study of this approach by doing it in residential, where patients were in a protective setting where they were supervised and monitored. And he tried to use this approach that's a focused version of DBT skills that are essential for processing trauma through exposure therapy. So he took patients in a German public system who had childhood sexual abuse, and half of them had BPD, and half of them just had complex PTSD or some form of PTSD. And they did a three-month program. And it was effective and had low dropouts and no suicide. So we know that this treatment is a, is a safe treatment and an effective treatment. These are some of the data for the residential trial. He probably went over this, but you can see that the treatment group in the red had massive reductions of PTSD symptoms. This is response and remission. Red are the people who had um, DBT PTSD versus those who are waiting for it. And this is the change on different scales that had to do with PTSD and other symptom scales like the depression inventory and the borderline symptom scale. So there's more improvement with this treatment than for those who aren't getting it. And this is the important thing, is that what he emphasized is that people who have active PTSD who are dissociating 
cannot learn anything in any therapy, whether it's an evidence-based therapy or some other treatment. So what you see in this diagram, which he may have gone over in his webinar, is that those who are B have BPD and are dissociated, the white, are not learning in a conditioning process, okay? So what his treatment really focuses on is blocking dissociation so that people can learn from treatment. So in the pr principles for this treatment, which I think is really a very efficient, effective treatment, is that there is a real focus first on commitment. They don't do all the elaborate work that regular DBT does on suicide and um, self-harm, which takes a long time because the paradox of VPD treatment, DBT in particular, is that it gets people to stop avoiding. So then they get more dysregulated because they're dealing with their problems and trying to manage them more effectively. But they then have suicidality and self-harm because that's what comes up under stress. So the DBT treatment is quite busy in trying to manage all these things together. But Martinville has tried to cut some of that out to make the treatment work faster, more effectively. And he gets people to agree to not try to commit suicide during the course of this treatment, okay? Of course, that's not like a foolproof method, but it actually is effective. Then they do psychoeducation about what BPD is and PTSD. Psychoeducation goes a long way and is underutilized. When you tell patients what the symptoms are of their disorder, they get better just from that intervention. What's PTSD, what can get better for, from treatments for PTSD? What's BPD, what can get better from treatments for BPD? And then there's a lot of exercises to help people not dissociate. Some of them are skills, like usual DBT skills, like using strong sensations like ice, um, exercise, ammonia, pain, you actually touch people, uh, press people at these pressure points to get them not to dissociate and, and it works. And clinicians are oftentimes very reluctant to touch patients, but patients are thankful to not dissociate. Okay, but this is something that you have to get consent over. And then when they have anti-dissociation skills, then you do the exposure. If you do the exposure without doing anti-dissociation work, they're not going to learn from it, or chances are they're not going to benefit from it. They might, but they may not because of the dissociation. Then you go through trying to differentiate between old ways and new ways. That whether you have BPD or PTSD, you learn to do the things you do now for a reason. And recovery is about trying to find new ways to cope to life as it is in the here and now. So you're trying to get them to experience the past and memories and realize that it's actually that their memories in the here and now, that you're not back in that place and in that time, that you are totally helpless and powerless. And so it tries to help people gain some mastery over having a sense that this is a memory now. I'm no longer a child. I can run. And in fact, some of the exposure is when people are on Stairmaster because the feeling of movement breaks up the experience that they physically had back in the time that they were being abused. Now, during this exposure, people need to use skills to block escape and stay connected to reality. Reality is the anchor. To be able to say, I'm here in this room, with um, these vents and these um, mechanical covers over the skylights, not in my childhood bedroom where I was repeatedly raped. So this rounding in reality, being able to appreciate I am now five, five, not three feet tall. These are things that help people survive the memories and see them as memories in the past, not in the present, that they have to live in a tortured way over and over and over again, intrusively, as they have flashbacks and nightmares. And while a lot of clinicians would be reluctant to kind of push patients to not dissociate or avoid during something so horrific as a memory of childhood abuse, 
it is really an act of compassion to get them beyond the nightmares and flashbacks and dissociation because living like that can be complete hell. And then, as they're doing that, they have to do some acceptance work that the trauma happened. It's a part of their life. It will never go away. They can heal from it, but it's part of their life story. And they can take responsibility for whatever margin they can. Oftentimes, people who are traumatized have had the experience or the ad adaptation to think it was all their fault. And you try to help them see what, what margin of responsibility they had and what they didn't control, what they were helpless over. And that's reality. It's not blaming them. It's just accepting what they experienced. And then you help them regulate guilt and shame. You reframe the responsibility, you defend, because the responsibility, the feeling that it was my fault, helps them avoid the memory of being so helpless and powerless. And I think Martin Bo has described that in his webinar. And also people feel a lot of shame from having been abused. And that um, clinicians are taught to normalize. That would be a normal response to those experiences. And instead of hiding, you do opposite to that emotion and try to connect with others. That's what's going to heal you. Now, briefly, Melanie Harned also did a version of combining DBT and, and prolonged exposure. She did a pilot that had some good results. It was a small study, and it's a longer treatment. In the interest of time, I'm not going to go over that. Um, but what I do want you to know is Martin Bohus and um, collaborators, which include Patricia Rezek, they have done a trial that's yet to be published but has very promising results. We are starting a clinic here at McLean Hospital um, doing a trial of this treatment, outpatient DBT PTSD, and we are also doing trainings in January. Um, it's to be announced after we get the CME um, <laughs> approved by Chris's office. But we are going to make this a publicly available CME course that has registration fees and CME credits. And you should join the BPDTI mailing list through emailing um, McLean. B okay, it's BPD Training Institute at partners.org. Okay, I'm going to skip this. There's the address. I couldn't remember it. <laughs> but um, that's my lecture for today. I hope it was helpful, and I'm open to questions. Great. Thank you very much, Dr. Choi Kane. That was um, a great presentation with a lot of um, new information. Um, we've got uh, a few questions. Um, I'll try to get through a couple of them uh, before we have to end. Um, the first one is really a, a little bit of a vignette, which I know you have to skip over. So, our 31-year-old daughter is being treated for complex PTSD, but she refuses to work. She has both a bachelor's degree and a master's in fine arts, so she's highly functioning intellectually. She has no friends. She doesn't have good family relationships. She and her mother tried family therapy, but she exploded in the second session and refused to do any more. She refuses group therapy. She has never been able to manage um, well in social groups. And with all of this, she feels controlled and victimized by us, her family. Um, she will send nasty diatribes to us in between relative periods of calm. And any, any advice for this, you know, this family who's really struggling, and I think this, unfortunately, is not an isolated case. Absolutely. I really have a lot of compassion for everybody involved. It must be very painful to be this 31-year-old woman who has complex PTSD when everything in the world feels dangerous and that you feel like that you're victimized. That's horrible to be reliving that and see that in all your situations. I think one of the major burdens of having PTSD is that there's a difficulty and a failure to differentiate 
what, between what has happened in the past, what's been traumatic and painful, what one most fears, and what is actually happening. So part of the burden of PTSD is you keep reacting to things as if it's the same thing happening over and over again, and then you get kind of stuck and handcuffed into the same thing happening over and over again, which is that people don't understand you, they don't support you, they don't agree with you, and it feels very insecure and unsafe. For family members in this situation, it can feel very um, traumatic also to feel so helpless and powerless in the face of seeing your loved one struggle and not being able to do anything about it. And then feeling like you messed up everything and you're the cause of all the problems. I think that's actually oftentimes a shared experience for the patient and the family. And so it's very difficult. And I think the state of the field now is kind of not at a point where it's easy to help these situations, which Chris, you're right, is very common. Now, what I would say about it is, you know, I think that the family guidelines for BPD can really come in handy anyways, that when a child is really angry about all the ways in which life has been unfair to them, being able to listen and being able to be hurt and try to still kind of um, hear them out, acknowledge the mistakes you've made, and try to support them and set limits. You know, have reasonable expectations. That's okay, too. You may not control what they ultimately do, but I think what you can do is have a voice. And sometimes getting some help through NEABPD, through family connections, can be helpful. Um, I think oftentimes clinicians would do well if the patient would allow them to coordinate with the family to kind of help broker some of these problems. Not all clinicians like to do that or have the tools or training to do that, but sometimes that can also help these situations. But my hope is advancing in, advances in understanding complex PTSD or the combination between PTSD and BPD can help more people who are in these situations get better. Great. And I, I think I'll go ahead and just do one more question. It's a hard one, but it's come up many times um, during this, these webinar series. And it, it has to do with um, situations where a child diagnosed with BPD makes a claim about a history of sexual abuse or physical abuse that the parents suspect actually never happened. And, and I think then parents are kind of questioning, like, does she or he really believe this? And, and it, it, it's conceivable maybe we missed it. Or does she or he really believe this and is like really kind of off the deep end and crazy because that never happened. Like what, what they're accusing us of doing never ever happened and if they really believe it then they're almost crazy, psychotic I mean. Or are they making it up as just like to be antagonistic or for an excuse or to vilify us. Um, and so this, this parent asked, like, what do I do when my child, my adult child is claiming a history of sexual abuse? I don't think it happened, but I also want to be supportive. I don't want to invalidate. And so, like, what am I supposed to do? This is a very useful question because unfortunately it's a very common dilemma. And what I would say is whether the person is being truthful or, or confused or even lying about ch childhood abuse or some sort of situation that was um, traumatic, I think that person is likely suffering regardless of whether or not the thing is true. And I think it's very difficult um, for everybody involved, the patient, um, included and also the family. But what I would say is that you have to um, try to approach it with balancing, trying to validate and hear your loved one in whatever way you can. And you need support in this. You need skills in this. Okay? And that's why, you know, I think something like Family Connections or Terror for BPD, these are really great support in the absence of not a lot of support. That being said, you know, I think that you, um, as family members, they also need to maintain some voice. You have to have a stake. And being able to say, I'm not sure, I'm confused, 
I don't understand this well enough. I'm, maybe I missed it. Um, and it's sad for me either way. It's sad for me whether or not I missed it or I made some horrible mistake and I didn't protect you. And it's sad for me if um, it's something that you are talking about to send a different message to me, that I um, was inadequate as a parent in some other way. There's some communication in it that I think you will both be better off to be able to hear and resolve. It may not mean it's true, what's truth. Everybody has a different angle on the truth. truth. But what's important is hearing each other out, airing your feelings and thoughts, and trying to move forward, having a reconciliation. You can agree to disagree by saying, like, I hear it. I hear that this is your experience and I want to respect it. I feel sad about it. And how can we move forward? Okay. I hope that's, I know that's hard and not satisfactory, but that's what I would recommend. Great. No, I think that's really helpful practical advice. Um, and we are going to have to stop for today. So I want to just remind people they can sign up for our next webinar on May 24th. You have got the link right in front of you. And a big thank you to Dr. Choi King, and we will see you next time. Thank you.